Welcome to season four of Healthcare Rounds. Here we explore the vast and rapidly evolving healthcare ecosystem with leaders across the spectrum of healthcare delivery. Our goal is to promote ideas that advance the quadruple aim, including improving the patient experience, improving the health of populations, lowering the cost of care, and attaining joy in work. I'm John Marchica, host of Healthcare Rounds. I'm also the CEO of Darwin Research Group and faculty associate at the Arizona State University College of Health Solutions. Please don't forget to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and send your questions, comments, or ideas for healthcare rounds to podcast at darwinresearch.com. Let's get started. Today, John speaks with Eric Levin, CEO of Scripta Insights. Eric is a seasoned executive and serial entrepreneur who has been involved in more than 32 merges and acquisitions. He has held several high-level roles at both large and small companies and has helped to grow multiple companies from startup through large-scale global success. Um, Eric, thanks so much for uh, agreeing to do this, for spending some time with me and the audience today. Um, you know, I was looking on LinkedIn before, and of course we had our pre-interview, but I realized, have you ever worked for anybody? I mean, you're <laughs> like, I thought I was a serial entrepreneur, but at least I had like, you know, some time with Abbott under my yeah. belt, but it looks like that, that you've yeah. been an entrepreneur almost your whole career. Well, it, it, not really. So the first 10 years of my career, uh, I, I, I did work for people, but but for eight of those 10, I worked for someone that everybody now seems to know, uh, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful on the Shark yeah. Tank. And so yeah. that was, a, it was a real company for sure. We were a publicly traded company and, and it became very large. When, th during the time that I was there, it grew from about uh, 30 million in sales to about $1.2 billion in sales. So we became wow. a pretty substantial company. Um, and and uh, if there's any doubt, yes, he's an entrepreneur, but he is definitely a boss, right? <laughs> so, you know, he, he is a pretty demanding guy to work for. Uh, and uh, and I felt I needed that. So for me, coming out of school, I was always interested in entrepreneurship, but I felt I needed some work experience. I don't think I could have been successful as an entrepreneur if I didn't get some. I, I think I really wouldn't have known what to do. Uh, but then as soon as I, I sort of had that experience, I, I did really go the entrepreneurial route and... Uh, and I love it. And, and I mostly love it because at the end of the day, uh, if it goes well, it goes well, like we're always happy, but if it goes badly, I, I have nobody to blame but myself. And, and I kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, um, do, do you know, Dan Sullivan, do, does that name ring a bell? No. So he's, um, he's probably retired from his position, but he, he ran an organization called the strategic coach. Okay. And it was uh, consulting for entrepreneurs and they had this whole program. I did it years and years ago. Um, but one of the things that, that he said was, is like people often say when they're working for another company that it's job security. But when you think about layoffs and, you yeah. know, being subject to the whims of your manager, your boss, you know, it's like when you're an entrepreneur, that's total job security because, whether you succeed or not is entirely up to you. You know, you know, yeah, and I, I also think that the world has changed. You know, there was a, a time you could go to work at IBM and retire at IBM, but that, that's certainly not the case anymore. Um, you know, my sister has had a much more corporate career and she literally was working at IBM and getting nothing but the rave reviews and bonuses and promotions. And then one day they said, well, we're eliminating like 10,000 jobs. And if, unless you want to move to someplace she had no interest in moving, you're, you're 30 more days, right? So I think the world has really changed there. But I, I would also say, going back to the entrepreneurship thing, I have very clear memory of, um, you know, there's the nice thing about working for a big company, especially if you're an executive, is that the paycheck fairy comes every month and deposits <laughs> this big check into you. And it's just like magical, right? Next thing right. you know, there's a lot of money in your account every month. And it's like, and, it, and you kind of take it for granted. And then when, my first truly entrepreneurial experience, like I remember depositing that first $10,000 check and it was, it was so tangible and it was also very empowering because it felt like I, all of a sudden, like it's that, you know, I knew how to fish. I didn't just catch it. Like, I didn't, somebody didn't give me a fish. I knew how to fish. And now I, I could have this confidence that no matter what happened, 
I could put food on the table. I, I have skills that somebody will pay me for. And I found that really transformative. Yeah, I remember my first company, Foxwatch, um, we had credit card processing. So I'm trying to remember exactly what we did. I think we, 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 had, a, we had the person's name and a transaction. It didn't look like a check. So it yeah. wasn't an actual check, but it was like $385 for a one-year subscription yeah. to Healthcare Business Daily. Um, yeah. That was back in 1994. And, uh, and we celebrated that, you know, it was yeah. just like, and, and people who haven't gone through it, who haven't, you know, had their house on the line. Uh, I remember with that first company, I was three months behind on my mortgage and I thought, wow. And I left a, I left a cushy, you know, awesome job to, to start that company and yeah. thinking like what, and I remember at that time, actually it was like, my wife at that time, so wife number one, um, she was out of the country and I was three months behind on my mortgage and it was around Christmas time and I was watching It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> and I'm just thinking like, did I make the right choice? And I, who knows, I was yeah. probably drinking scotch or something at the time, you know? Yeah. And um, so it's, a, it's an interesting journey people who like you and me who've made the choice to kind of go it out is. on their own and, 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 and build, a, build and, an organization. And can be very fulfilling. And, and I, you know, uh, I, I, you know, there, there's pros and cons to both lives, right? Like, I mean, there, there's, it's, it's, there's great things about working with a large company and having an employer yeah. and there's great things about, and, and vice versa. There's painful things about each of them. I've done each of them because of my last in, you know, I, I've sold, I sold my last company. And as part of that, I had to stay for three years and work as an executive at this $20 billion a year conglomerate based out of Asia. And, you know, so I, I very recently had, you know, kind of a big corporate job and it's it just different. It's just different. Like there is not one. And, and then you have to figure out what works for you and what gets you up in the morning and makes you excited. And for me, uh, I get excited building things. Uh, I get excited when I can kind of get my fingers in the dirt and, and, and farm it. And, and so it just, you know, I figure if I'm going to be stressed out either way, I might as well be stressed out in something I enjoy <laughs> versus something yeah. that feels like work. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The, the time that I spent uh, at Abbott was invaluable. The years that I was with Abbott, just understanding, you know, how, how corporations work. Um, I never rose to like the highest levels of management, but I had a variety of different positions in product management and pricing and managed care. And um, I started out by selling. Uh, you don't get anywhere in the pharmaceutical industry unless you carry the bag. Yep. So I had to do that. Um, so I agree with you. It, you know, there's pluses and minuses no matter where you go. So anyway, enough about entrepreneurship. Um, <laughs> tell me about, um, before we get into your company. Sure. I, I've, I've had a couple of guests already that are related to the pharmacy benefit management industry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to say at least two, maybe three at this point. So from your perspective, what's wrong with the PBM industry? Yeah. So, so it's interesting. You, you know, I just interviewed somebody today who, who, had a 25 year career in the PBM industry. So I was having this exact conversation. I said, what is it like to be on the other side of this? So we, we just sort of had this conversation. You know, I, I don't know that I necessarily characterize it as right or wrong because because I'm a pretty free market guy, right? Like I'm a capitalist and I believe in our system. Um, I think what's wrong with the system though is, is a couple of things. It, one is somewhat systemic in that there's an oligopoly of sellers, right? I think that, that right. you know, there's, there's a misunderstanding in our country today that capitalism shouldn't have regulation. And, and that's really not the case. For capitalism to work well, in fact, you need regulation. Um, in, in, and, and so we used to, as a, comp as a country, be much tighter about antitrust issues than we are today. Right? We really let things go. And, and when, you, when you have an oligopoly of sellers, uh, you're always going to have an imbalance in the market. So that's point number one, and it's a big part of what we do. But point number two that's also really interesting is 
the, the buyers of PBM services seem to not really fully understand that they're doing business with a for-profit organization that is the fox guarding the hen house. They, they hire them and they think that because they've hired them, they're on their side. And, and they're not. In fact, their fiduciary duty as publicly held companies is to maximize their shareholder value and stock value, right? So they're right. trying to maximize profit every single minute of every single day. So when you hire a PBM, if you think that their job is to get you the best deal all the time, you're, you're deluding yourself. And unfortunately, the, 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 there's so many people in the, in the buy side of this equation that just sort of let the fox guard the hen house. And, and, and often we'll say, well, we could do this and they say, we'll do this for you. And we'll save you all this money. Say, well, our, doesn't our PBM do that? Well, well, sort of, but not really, right? Because they have a very different goal at the end of the day than you do. Their goal is to make money for them and your goal is to save money for you. So, so if you put those two things together, one is, is systematic and one is actually perceptional, right? And, um, and, and it makes for right. um, some, a lot of waste, frankly. I mean, at the end of the day, there's just a lot of in, um, uh, excess money being spent that's caused by inefficiencies of a market that has those characteristics. So does the fact that, you know, we've got Optum under United, uh, we've got Caremark under CVS. Um, we've got uh, Cigna Express Scripts. Does the fact that there is a payer PBM relationship make things worse for the consumer or worse for the employer? Or is it kind of a, a, a neutral or a non-event? I think that, that it's fundamentally more neutral than you might think, right? Just because the two things are together does not necessarily mean a bad thing for the client. But going back to the initial discussion, the, the, the concept that by putting them together, by buying them as a bundled service, you're going to get a better deal is a misperception, right? So, so it really does, sure. uh, it, gives, it gives a really strong selling story to the sell side and if the buy side isn't very, uh, really well versed in, in how to control their spend and, and read between the lines and understand what they're buying and doesn't have all the data they need to, to, to really stay on top of whether it's happening, uh, the buyer is going to lose in that equation. Um, and, and so, you know, we see people that are carved in, as they say, where they're connected or carved out where you have a separate PBM from your insurance carrier. And, and, uh, I would tell you that one doesn't do better than the other because of that. One does better than the other because they're either a better buyer or a worse buyer. And, and so mm. what we really focus on is trying to help people be a better buyer. So the, the, from what I understand, I mean, there is, there is a value proposition that PBMs due to their, I mean, we, you talked about an oligopoly. So when you look at the largest ones, um, they do command uh, a, a large number of lives. And so they can negotiate better discounts, better rebates. So there is some value creation there. Sure. At the same time, what's the problem with having so much power concentrated in the few? Yeah. So, so I think that the, the, the simplest way to put this right is I always back it up and say, forget it's pharmacy. This is a buyer seller transaction, right? So think about your entire company. If you make, if you make products, physical products, you have a sourcing group and let's say you buy circuit boards. I guarantee you have a sourcing person, a cost, a buyer who's a, maybe a cost account who knows exactly what a circuit board should cost. He knows what the market are for circuit boards. He looks at every bill that comes in. And that's the same, even like think about hiring, right? Your HR department knows by region, by job role, approximately how much you should be paying for somebody, right? Right. And then you come into this space and nobody knows what a drug costs. Like literally nobody knows. So you have this one area of your business where you're not buying the same way you buy every other part. Like we have 150 years of, of business best practices around sourcing things. And we, we throw them out the window when it comes to this. And, and so, you know, it's really kind of fundamentally understanding that and becoming a better buyer that changes this dynamic because yet the, the truth is because they have so much power if they wanted to 
the big guys could give you the best deal, period. But do they want to? <laughs> right? And if they don't want to, because their goal is to make money, do you have the tools to squeeze it out of them like you do with your steel supplier and your chip supplier and your paperclip supplier? Um, and, and, and so the bigger they are and the better the story they can tell, hey, come with us, we can do your medical and we can do your this and we'll put it all together. And because we're so big, you're going to give the best deal. Don't worry. You trust me. I, I'm, right. that's a lot of what happens, right? Cause it's, it's sensible on the surface. Like, Hey, listen, and, and, and by the way, we'll guarantee you a huge rebate, huge rebate. We're going to give you $10 million a year at the end of the year. We're just going to write you a check. You really ought to ask yourself why they have $10 million to give you back at the end of the year. Right? Like, right. This, is, this is like, you know, it's so fundamentally kind of flawed from a purchasing perspective. Right. And I think sometimes when you, when you get yourself out of the complexity of, of this marketplace and it is really complex and start to think of it that way, suddenly, you know, things become a lot clearer and, and it doesn't matter how complex it is because now you're just focused on best practices of buying anything. Right. Yeah. I wonder if I've always wondered from the pharma perspective, like if they grudgingly accept the fact that they have this middleman in the transaction, or if pharma sits around and, and says, you know, we'd be better off without them. We'd be better off without this, uh, you know, negotiator, this middleman. And I, yeah. I, 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 I've always, I haven't had this conversation. I probably should. Uh, with well, with pharma folks, what do you think? Well, I, I go back sometime and watch the the testimony of the CEO of the company that makes the EpiPen when she was pulled in front of Congress and getting destroyed. I remember trying that. to explain to them that no, 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 the prices went up, but the prices really went down. Yeah, see, we charge more, but ultimately people pay less. Do you think she wants to have that conversation? Do you think that she really is sitting there going, I want to charge $800, but give $700 of rebates? Or do you think she'd rather sell it for $100 and not be fit sitting in front of Congress? I, I would tell you that from my perspective, I watch those and I say, there's no way that pharma can be happy about the fact that you have three middlemen in an oligopoly and two distributors in an oligopoly that control their ability to get from their labs where they create amazing things that save lives to patients that need it. And there's people in the middle that their core job is to do paperwork, right? They were created actually to, for a self-insured in, in a, a company in particular, to be able to process their claims for them. That, right. That's their core job, right? Claims processing. But they, but they evolved into this, this role in the market where they became the arbiter of what goes on a formulary and where it's ranked in a formulary and therefore how much are you going to give me to put it up higher on your formulary? Well, you'll give me more. Oh, great. But if I'm going to give you more, I have to charge you more. Otherwise I don't have any more to give you. And we created this whole system that, that in my, again, and I haven't talked to pharma people either, but I, I got to believe if I'm a pharma CEO, it makes me insane because I'm getting lambasted every day about the cost of drugs and how unfair right. it is and why are these the inflation. And, and ultimately they're saying, but we're giving lower net prices. We're giving low. How, how, why are you yelling at me? Because list price is what makes them look bad. And that's all caused by the PBM. Well, and it wouldn't get it. If you, if you eliminated PBMs tomorrow, it wouldn't necessarily get any better because the, the chain pharmacies, uh, you know, Walgreens, CVS, and of course CVS has, has the PBM, Wal Walgreens has a PBM as well, yeah. um, that the lion's share of the pharmacy market and retail pharmacy is held by, it's, it's an oligopoly again. So, yeah. you know, the, I don't know that it would necessarily get any better. Um, anyway, we're up in the clouds. And, and I think that, yeah, well, I think they serve a really important function too, right? Like, I mean, I think it'd be really hard for companies to do, they need somebody to do what a PBM does. The, the only question is, do, does the PBM need to have that much control and, and make that much money on it, right? And, and that's really where 
kind of it, kind of the problem starts to come in if, you, if you're on the payer side. And I, I look at everything from the payer side, right? Like that's that's our business is to help right. lower costs for our clients. Um, so, you know, again, fundamentally, I, I don't, I'm not one who's going to sit here and tell you, oh, PBMs are ruining everything and PBMs should all go away. I, I think what we push for is more transparency in the total marketplace. Um, and and we, I think you and I had a, a bit of this conversation, but but very simply, we look at the role, we, we look at any other market where there's, uh, where there's a buyer seller asymmetric asymmetry of marketing of um, information, right? Right. So, so you know, um, the example I always give is sourcing goods from Asia. Um, it, not a lot of people know about it, but it's fascinating actually. And the way that that was always done was it was really hard to buy things from a factory in China. They don't speak the language. They're really far away, et cetera, et cetera. So these organizations called agents sat in the middle, and and they would sit in places like Hong Kong, and they spoke English and. Cantonese and Mandarin, and they would help you do business in China. And since you couldn't speak Chinese and, and, and they were sitting in the middle, they could kind of tell you anything you wanted. Like, you know, how much does that cost? You know, can you get it for a dollar? And they know they can get it for 50 cents, but they say I can get it for 75 and they keep the difference. And this was the model of, of that trader, that middleman in, in sourcing goods. Well, then Alibaba, Alibaba comes along and takes advantage of technology. And suddenly I can go on the internet and I can right. say, I want to buy a, a, a thousand widgets and I can have 10 factories give me a direct price quote immediately. That's really the same kind of thing that's happening in, in the pharmacy space, right? And so what, is, what happened to the middlemen in that corollary? <laughs> it wasn't good. Lian Fung is the largest sourcing company in the world. They do about $20 billion in revenue. They haven't made a penny of profit in six, seven years. Uh, so they've done maybe $120 billion dollars in sales and haven't made a penny because the transparency that came through that technology ultimately made the middleman's job different. And, and I think that, that that's what we think can happen that will help balance this market and put the PBMs back in the role that they should be in, as opposed to the role of collecting all the profits that pharma or, uh, or uh, the employer should have. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, when you think about how technology has disrupted uh, the middleman um, in so many different markets. I mean, the obvious ones is, uh, as you described in the, in the Chinese market, you know, the one that everybody talks about these days is Uber and other ride sharing platforms. Uh, the experience, I mean, if you think about it as a consumer, the experience of using Uber versus hailing a taxi, you know, it's very, very different and it's at a lower yeah. price. So I'm wondering, and I want, I want to get to, is I was going to talk about disruption, and you know, sure. gave me a great example of that. Tell me about um, how your company is disrupting the the PBM marketplace, and how you're actually able to save money for payers and employers, and I guess ultimately the consumer. Yeah, it, it's um, it's definitely for for all payers. And so payers, so somebody pays half the bill and somebody pays the other half. Not, it's not 50, 50 usually, but there's some percentage paid by right. the patient and some percentage paid by, you know, either an insurance company or, or by a self-insured employer. So, so ultimately, you know, it comes back to the principles that we started talking about, right? So how do you, how are you a better buyer of things? And, and the, the, the answer to that is generally the more informed you are as a buyer, the better buyer you'll be. The better you understand what you're buying, what it should cost, what the alternatives to those things that you're buying could be and what the trade-offs would be, the better buyer you'll be. And I don't care what it is you're buying. Like that's true whether you're buying circuit boards or whether you're buying hula hoops, right? Like this is, this is the core of buying. The problem in PBM space is that if you think about it, again, we have this oligopoly of expert sellers, right? And they have pharmacists and doctors and all these experts that work for them. And the buyers are very fragmented, right? There's, there, even if you're a large employer, maybe you have 100,000 lives or 150,000 lives, it's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket for your supplier. They have you know, 20, 30, 40 million lives, right? right. So you're, you're never really that important to them. So on your side as the buyer, do you have a pharmacist on staff? Probably not. Do you have a doctor on staff? Probably not, right? So, so ultimately, you are uh, relying on your supplier to provide all the expertise. And, and you have no way of verifying whether or not they're optimizing the deal you made. And so what we do is we are, we've developed a system of software that can take your bill every month when you get it, go through it with expert eyes. Like, so from a technology perspective, we, we would call it an expert system. 
We've taken the brains of 27 doctors and pharmacists and everything they know about how to save money on every drug and coded it into a system. And we update it every single day, practically, as new things change in the market. Plus data analytics, a big data issue uh, uh, problem, which is you have all this information, how could I possibly go through it all? If you can take an expert system and a data analytics system, put it together and have it read your bill for you, what it spits out is all of the areas where you could be saving money in a digestible way that you can understand, right? So, so it's broken down where it doesn't just say, hey, you're spending a lot on specialty drugs. Well, we know that. Well, there's you know 20 different strategies within specialty drugs. Uh, let's take one that is, say, um, uh, limiting the initial fill quantity. Are you doing that? No, it looks like we filled a whole bunch of specialty drugs on the first fill for 30 days. That first fill for 30 days might cost 10, 20, $30,000, but you took it the pill for three days, you had a bad reaction and you threw the rest away. So you, you've now thrown away $28,000 worth of a drug. So what you need is a policy that says on your first fill of an expensive specialty drug, you'll, you start with seven day supply. Make sure you don't have a reaction. If you don't, then you can get the rest of the month. So we've shown you within your data where there's leakage, where there's waste, We've told you exactly what the strategy is you can do about it. And now you can sit down and have an informed discussion with your PBM and say, hey, from now on, we want you to put a little switch in your system that says this, these specialty drugs can only be prescribed on its first prescription for seven tablets or vials or whatever it is at a time. And then if the person has a good reaction, you can go forward. That simple thing might save a company a million dollars a year. So are... Are you using AI to, I guess, inform best practices, or are you also looking at the prices that companies are paying for drugs? Because, I, you know, PBMs will negotiate different discounts, different rebates. Are you able to, to discern the differences there, or are you mainly looking at best practices? No, we, we definitely are. So we, we're benchmarking uh, against all kinds of data, uh, including pricing data, regional pricing data. I'll give you an example, like so very simple AI, right? This is, this is like in, in the simplest terms of what machine learning or AI means. So, so our system can say two people work for the same employer and they fill the same prescription and they were in the same zip code, but they paid two different prices. Ding, 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 what's going on? And they can look and say, oh, Walgreens in this market is cheaper than CVS for that drug. And then we can go and alert all the people that live in that zip code. Hey, instead of filling that prescription at Walgreens, go to CVS and you'll save $10 a month. That's $120 a year. So, so those are, so AI in our world works um, in, in to identify patterns that might be hard to see because the data is so big, right? This is sort of what, right. what comes down to so many transactions. It, would a human with a spreadsheet ever have gotten to that level where they caught that like th this, this, it's usually a, a cluster of zip codes, but let's just say it's a zip code where it's cheaper at one pharmacy. You probably would never get there, but, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's the, how do you eat an elephant thing, right? Everybody wants to save all this money. There's so much money on the table, but they, you don't wear a star. And the answer is you, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And, and if you just attack every, every little hole in your boat, that's letting in water, you have to find it, you have to patch it. And guess what? Next month, a new hole comes and we have to find it, we have to patch it. And that vigilance, that ability to see through, <laughs> you think about the movie, The Matrix, where the, you know, the, the uh, symbols are all falling down and like you can kind of see through the matrix and go, oh, there's a pattern there. That, that's really what you're able to do using you know, machine learning software and expert systems. It, it's pretty much impossible to do uh, in any regular basis um, in, in today's environment. So we look at it as like, you know, today you're, you're sort of fighting with a slingshot. We're, we're about to bring a machine gun to the fight. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you said that, that you, you're working with the payers, but it seems like you're really servicing the employers. I mean, the, ultimately in, you know, most people in, in this country, they get their health insurance through their employers. So, yeah. They're the ones that are footing the bill, and if you're identifying these patterns, um, uh, like you said, you know whether it's an expensive specialty med, let's start you on seven days versus thirty days, um, or it's looking at pricing discrepancies between a CVS and a Walgreens in your given market. Ultimately, it's the payer that benefits, right? 
It is. So, so for, in our world, the, the payer is, is a self-insured employer or a regional health plan that does not own their own PBM. So a lot of the regional health plans are, are outsourcing their PBMs to like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, who we use for our benefits, uses Express Scripts as their PBM, right? So the, my benefits are with Blue Cross Blue Shield and Express Scripts. So, so there's, there's, a, um, there's a very similar situation that both of them have. And then the other part of the payer is if you're a, health plan, a regional health plan, it's your member or for an employer, you think of them as your employees. And, and there's a whole other piece there. One of the things that really bothers me, right, is, is when we go out and we have a meeting at a board level and, and you get an HR department who will say like, well, you know, our, our, our uh, co-pays are so low, you know, they're, they're only $25. No, nobody's going to take action to save $25. And, and we know that's not true. We know statistically people will change for $10, but let's, let's extrapolate that out. If the average person is on three drugs, they can save $10 a month. That's $30 a month times 12 months. That's Christmas. Right? That, right. It's really, really a big deal. So helping, we live in a world where we have consumer directed healthcare, right? Which is this wonderful euphemism for push it onto the consumer. And, and I love the idea of it, be a better shopper. But how on earth is Eric Levin, who went to business school, going to be a better shopper for pharmacy? I don't know anything about pharmacy when I get like, so my doctor tells me to take Dimista, I take Dimista. Now this happened to me. I went, I got prescribed Dimista for an allergy. I went to CVS to pick it up. It was $428. I called my company and said, I just got prescribed Dimista. It's $420. Do we have any strategies? And, and my company said, well, yeah, Dimista is just fluticasone and azelastine mixed in the same bottle. Get two separate prescriptions. It's exactly the same thing. You'll have to right. put four, four squirts in your nose instead of two. Call my doctor back, got it done, $32. So <laughs> you, you think about the difference there. You're talking about saving you know, $370, $380 a month times 12 months. And, and it's my burden until $5,000 deductible is hit. And then it's my company's burden. So if you can give consumers the tools to be better consumers, they will be. And that's where we, we really come in on that side of our business is, is our core business is PBM optimization. It's helping the, the, the buyer of PBM services buy better. But part of helping them buy better is helping their members make better decisions. Their members can't make better decisions if they don't have better information, right? So it, it all sort of comes together and completes the circle. So do you see um, a consumer strategy in your future? For sure. So we, we have one now that's, that's a part of what we do um, for consumers uh, that, that we work with their employers, right? So we already do that. Uh, but we, we also see an opportunity to help people that, that are not with our service um, in the future as well. We, we don't see it as a core part of, of what we want to do. We don't see ourselves as primarily a direct-to-consumer business, but, but we love the idea of helping people save money on their pharmacy and building a brand that, that means that, right? And, and if that ultimately helps us to build our brand and, and get more people um, to be smart consumers, we think it helps our whole business. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, GoodRx is, uh, is in that space. Uh, in, in terms of trying at least to help consumers they save are. money. So uh, I spent my Sunday night reading their S1. Have you, have you read it? I haven't, no. You haven't. So, so I spent Sunday night reading it. It's fascinating. 98% of their revenue comes from the three major PBMs. Really? So, so yep. So, so the company that is the great savior of the consumer that's going to defeat the system that's holding us all down makes... 98% of their money from the oligopoly that created the system that they then can help people skirt. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, and uh, and what, I think what they do is great. They save, I think, $20 billion for, for people. That's amazing. And, and uh, but, but it's also, you know, from a larger perspective, when we look at it, there are times when somebody using a coupon, if you're a self-insured employer, the reason pharma does all this, the reason that they let GoodRx give their coupons, right, is because they're trying to get around the plan design that you've created, right? So you've made a drug more expensive to try to get a consumer to talk to their doctor about taking a less expensive one. And then GoodRx comes and says, no, take the expensive one. We'll give you a coupon. It'll be the same price. Well, guess who pays the rest of that still? The employer. Right. So there are times, so, so it always fascinates me when I see employers offer GoodRx as part of their benefits because 
there are times when that's good for them and there are times that it's really bad for them. You know, if you think about drug pricing and PBMs, I mean, this is a very complicated subject. I've talked to people in pharma uh, who've been in pharma their whole careers and they don't understand the whole pricing model and how it works. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting how you're, you're approaching the issues with pharmacy benefits in a very different way than folks that I've talked to. Um, to kind of wrap things up, what are your final thoughts on, on PBMs and where we are today and, and where, we're, where, where you see things in, in the next three to five years? Yeah, you know, so, so I think generally, you know, we're pretty optimistic just in terms of, you know, there's a lot of technology coming into the market and we think technology has a pretty good chance of making positive disruption for, for the industry. Uh, and ultimately, you know, what we really would say is, you know, our discussions with the buy side, right? If you're, if you're an employer or a regional health plan, um, use the technology to, to be a better buyer, right? And, and so, you know, it's, it's don't, don't think that the government's going to somehow rescue us. Don't think that suddenly the, the whole market's going to change. It's, it's most likely not. Like the chances right. are that's not what's going to happen. But what can happen is that, is that there are new weapons in your war on cost containment that you can take advantage of. And I think if you start to think about the relationship you have with your PBM and how you do cost containment around your pharmacy spend, the way you do other parts of your spend, and, and you start to use good best practice techniques and align yourself with uh, the experts who have the systems that can help you get better information to be better informed to make better decisions to have better negotiations and to optimize whatever deal you're in there's a lot of money on the table and it's not really that disruptive right like we don't spend a lot of time telling people to change their pbm it's not even part of our business we say you have a deal let's make the most of the deal you have right you have a contract already how do we get the, the most out of it and if you're going to have a new contract done wouldn't it be nice if you had a really good understanding of your spend patterns and your population so that when you're negotiating your new contract, you really are negotiating from a point of expertise and knowledge of your specific population and needs as opposed to national benchmarks, let's say, or past performance that might indicate, you know, what might happen in the future, which it, we kind of know it doesn't, right? So it, the one thing that's pretty much guaranteed is the minute you sign your PBM contract, it's out of date. Because three months later, your population's changing and the market's changing and the drug market. Sure. So, so really don't think of it as a, as a, you know, something you do once a year, or once every three years. Think of it as a discipline. We're going to really take a look at how we're spending our money every month. And we're going to really go to our partner, our, our vendor, our PBM and say, hey, we're seeing some things we want to control. And here's the, the, the facts around those things. And, and what can we do about it? Just simply taking that attitude as opposed to sort of, you know, assuming your PBM is always on your side and, and, and looking out for your best interest at every moment um, just will have a huge impact. I mean, generally, we see 46% savings opportunity when we do an analysis. Now, wow. that is la-la land. That's if every transaction was optimized. That's not what's going to happen. But if there's 46% on the table in a $300 billion industry. It's 150 billion dollars on the table. I mean, what if you could capture 30 billion? That's a lot of money, right? Like it's like so. And generally, we do capture about a third of the savings opportunity on the table. So there's really no reason you shouldn't be seeing decreases year over year of 10 to 15 percent when most people are seeing increases of six to eight percent. So I, I meant to wrap it up there, but I'm going to ask you one final question. <laughs> yeah, you can choose not to answer. Um, and that is in your business model, are you going at risk or are, in other words, are you sharing yeah. in some of the savings or do you charge a flat fee? Yeah, no, I'm happy to answer that because we, we feel really strongly about it. So we charge a PM, PM or PEPM, depending on how it converts, right? Um, and, uh, and we do that for a couple of reasons. The most important reason is that ethically, we would never want somebody to say that we're recommending a less expensive drug because it makes us more money. Uh, we just would never want to be in that position. And, and second, and then there's a business issue, which is people that put the, put the, to do their spend at risk tend to end up fighting with their customers later when they send them a bill, right? And the customer says, what do you mean I owe you, you know, $50,000? And now you're fighting with them about like, I don't, I don't want that relationship with my, with my customers either. What I want to do is give them a price that's so fair 
And it's so obvious that we're returning a return on investment that, that they say, yeah, this is a no brainer. So we charge a PM, PM fee, uh, typically returns three to five times cash ROI in the same year. So it, it pays back right away. Um, and uh, it's measurable, it's trackable, it's traceable, um, it's defensible. And, um, and, and that way we're all working towards the same goal. Eric, Eric Levin. It's been it's been great. Uh, we've we've talked about everything from entrepreneurship to uh, disrupting industries to the um, insane world of pharmacy benefits. <laughs> so, uh, if if folks want to to find you, how how do they uh, how do they find your company and how do they find you? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn like everyone else in the world, so feel free to reach out. Eric Levin at Scripta Insights, and it's uh, scriptainsights.com uh, is our website, and that's as good a place as any to start. And uh, we're we're happy to help anyone answer any questions. We we do a lot of you know free work up front for people, so there's very little obligation until you realize until we all agree that there's money on the table that you want to save, and and, uh, and and we love meeting new people. So please do reach out. Great. And, and I, I want to say something to kind of wrap things up for our listeners. Um, you know, we're, we're not in the infomercial business. Um, so it's not like we're here to plug uh, Eric's business and he knows that. Um, what we do try to find is, you know, the, the, the aim of Healthcare Rounds is to, to find people who are aligned with the, the quadruple aim, right? So it's, it's saving money, it's improving the health of populations, um, um, it's improving care. It's 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 improving the the joy of work, and and so we try to find people whether it's you know the chief population officer for a, a major health system, or uh, it's an entrepreneur like like Eric Levin here who's come up with a unique way of making healthcare better and more affordable. Um, so um, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. I certainly did. And, uh, and, and if you're interested in finding out more about Eric, you can find him on LinkedIn or at the, his website. So, uh, Eric, thanks again. I, I appreciate you. your time. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, staying in touch. Absolutely. Thank you. all of us at Darwin Research Group, thanks for listening. Healthcare Rounds is produced by me, Kim Ishudo, and is engineered by Andrew Rojek. Theme music by John Marchica. Darwin Research Group provides advanced market intelligence and in-depth customer insights to healthcare executives. Our strategic focus is on healthcare delivery systems and the global shift toward value-based care. Find us at darwinresearch.com. See you next round.